As mentioned, very happy to have everyone with us today. Today, we're actually talking about uh, peer review, and that uh, that stems from the uh, the CSOP, the Clinical Engineering Standards of Practice, which uh, Bill uh, kindly uh, presented on for us a few months ago. <clears throat> Excellent topic for us today for that peer review. Lots of great things to come out of a peer review. Really, really consider strongly uh, uh, doing a peer review. Um, to talk about it today, we have two excellent folks who actually participate on that peer review group. Um, as well, they uh, they were with me on the sub subcommittee to um, develop the revision of said uh, clinical engineering standards of practice. So today we have uh, Kelly Cove and Bill Gentles. I'm sure you recognize those names from, um, we all have lots of gray hairs, so you probably recognize the names from different things over the years. Um, but they're, they're going to alternate back and forth to the presentation. So Kelly's going to start. So Kelly Cobe, if you don't already know, uh, he's clinical engineering director with Alberta Health Services in Calgary, and he's been a member of the CMBS peer review committee since like 2017 and participated in the peer review, for instance, in Niagara Health System in 2018. Um, Kelly received the CMBS Outstanding uh, Canadian Biomedical Engineering Technology Award in 2017 uh, and the Fellows Award in 2023. Very prestigious, that last one. Um, after 35 years in the industry, he volunteers his time back, both provincially and nationally. Um, I do a lot of work, for instance, with him uh, at, that, at that national level, uh, including the last two reviews of the Clinical Engineering Standards of Practice. So that's Kelly. Very happy to have him with him have him with us today. Uh, we also have Bill Gentles. Um, Bill currently is Vice President of BT Medical Technology Consulting. Uh, so in that role, he has uh, conducted many incident investigations of medical devices. He's participated in many peer review surveys for CBS. Uh, kind of as I implied, he was, uh, or no, sorry, he is chair for the International Outreach Committee for the Society. Uh, has traveled uh, to many low resource countries to teach clinical engineering topics on that volunteer basis. Um, what I was going to say, although he doesn't list it in his bio, I will call out that Bill was our fearless chair of said clinical engineering standards of practice uh, revision. Um, so we thank him again very much for that work. And folks will, of course, remember uh, uh, Bill um, for the 28 years that he served as director of Biomedical Engineering at Sunnybrook Health Science Center in Toronto. So without further ado, um, actually a little, little prep first. So as is normal, um, I'll turn my uh, my screen off. Uh, Adil wishes he was here with us today, so but he's here in spirit. Um, as is normal, please in, uh, write your questions in the Q&A, not the chat, but in the Q&A box. I'll monitor that. If I can answer things as we go along, like I'll type them in, great. Um, if not, we'll answer them in the session in the past. And um, we'll do, I think we're going to do like about a 40-minute presentation and 50 minutes at the at the end, folks. I think it's it's somewhere somewhere with that. Nice chunk of uh, time for questions at the end. Um, upcoming webinars uh, and um, uh, and of course the conference. Uh, so please look at the the, the bulletin for that. Uh, for instance, March, once again, very pleased to have Women in Engineering Month. We have some great content for you for that. But today we have peer review. So without further ado, um, Kelly, I think you said that you will uh, pick things off. You have the floor. Sure. Well, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh depending on what part of the country you guys are, are listening into from today. Um, I just wanted to sort of start us off here with uh, the fact that clinical engineering and biomedical engineering departments um, across Canada do have this opportunity to be reviewed by their peers. And of course, it's based on the uh, CMBS clinical engineering standards of practice. And although some of the participants here at this webinar today uh, may not have heard about it. Uh, there might be individuals that have heard about it but haven't had a review. And then there might even be some individuals or um, groups um, that have actually had a peer review done in the past. But what a lot of um, people on the call or on this webinar might not 
be aware of is how long this peer review um, opportunity has been around. Uh, I was reviewing that and it's been around for over 20 years. Uh, the very first clinical engineering standards of practice document was completed in 1998. And although the first official uh, peer review was done in 2003, um, there was actually quite a few um, sort of uh, test runs um, across uh, a couple of different departments um, just to make sure that uh, they tweaked out everything before that first review. So yeah, this this opportunity has been around for 20 plus years. So um, this presentation today will definitely sort of give you a, a very high level overview of what the whole process is about. So um, I don't know, Bill, do you have anything else you want to add to that or, before we proceed? Sure, just, just one other comment that um, this is one of the... <laughs> numerous benefits of membership in CMBES. So you need to be a member of CMBES or somebody in your organization to be able to request a peer review. Um, so if you're not a member, join up. And uh, we'll move to the next slide. So there are many benefits to peer review. We'll try and just highlight some of them today. Um, but it's uh, designed to affirm well-established programs, provide recognition of excellence, and give you a baseline for improvement and also opportunities for knowledge exchange. So um, baseline for improvement, we're not necessarily looking to only review people who have all their ducks in mind, but if you are uh, in the middle of an improvement process or you're early on and you're not sure where to put your energy, the peer review process uh, brings a set of um, outside eyes looking at your um, operation and um, helping you to prioritize things you could work on first to make have the biggest impact. So um, moving on to the next slide, over to Kelly. Yeah, so the process, of course, uh, involves surveyors and they will interview, they'll come to your uh, facility or even your program and uh, interview members of senior administration. And it's that level that we're really highlighting the, 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 the scope of what clinical engineering or biomedical engineering can provide to um, your facility or, or your region. Um, in that half hour meeting, um, we'll raise questions about the service and maybe even some possibility of what new services might look like that the, the the service could provide um, and at the same time they'll have questions that we'll be able to answer as well as a result of these meetings though um, that's where the administrators you know at different levels within the organization really kind of hear and realize what the importance of clinical engineering can provide um, to that particular uh, hospital and or region and um yeah, so it's it's just heightening that um, visibility to clinical engineering. Bill? Okay, I'll put on the next slide. So we audit your processes in the department. We um, From that audit, we give a prioritized list of suggested improvements, and these can improve, these can include um, suggestions to expand your services into new areas. And that gives you the opportunity to use those uh, recommendations as a justification to ask for increased resources. We could say, you know, you should be uh, looking at um, medical imaging equipment. Maybe the ultrasound machines that are under service contract should be uh, serviced in the uh, clinical engineering department. Um, reduce costs and um, give you the opportunity to hire more personnel. Next slide. And on, on, you know, it's a kind of a, a two-way thing, too, because the surveyors also benefit by the exchange of ideas that take place during the survey. So, again, a lot of feedback, gathering a lot of information, sharing that information, providing feedback back to the service, as well as sur surveyors um, can learn and also see what's going on. Um, you know, there's a lot of uniquenesses uh, to 
the clinical engineering and biomedical engineering programs across the country. Obviously, a lot of um, commonality, but uh, you know, some zones or, or some provinces might um, be trying something new and, and being very successful in that. And so, again, the, the that would be a learning for the surveyors as well as being able to share that amongst other people within a survey as well. Bill? And some more benefits. So by coming into your organization as outside experts and then interviewing, you know, a number of your stakeholders, we're raising your profile. So people generally are impressed if uh, your service has brought outside experts to come in and assess their service. That's a that's an impressive looking thing, and it raises your profile among your stakeholders. Um, our our survey um, also addresses accreditation requirements, so you can uh, point out the fact to accreditation surveyors that you've had um, a review of your department by experts. Usually, a cr hospital accreditation surveyors are not experts in clinical or biomedical engineering. In fact, it's kind of shameful how little they know about biomedical engineering when they come into a survey. So, um, and that was part of the initiative to start our own survey was because a lot of us were really unimpressed with the accreditation survey that the part of it that um, visited biomedical engineering departments. Uh, and so we that's that was part of the motivation for starting this peer review just for clinical engineering. So giving you an outside opinion on priorities and opportunities for improvement carries a lot more weight in most organizations than um, an internal employee of the organization saying, we need to be doing this, pounding on the desk and saying, you got to give us more resources because we're, you know, we're looking after patient safety. But if some outside experts come into the organization and make the same point, it carries a lot more weight, which is not necessarily a good thing, but it's reality. Um, so usually our uh, reports include recommendations that give you justification for getting increased funding or staffing. Really? Yeah, and Bill, just maybe to even add on to that accreditation component, mm -hmm. um, with 20 plus years of the peer review um, in place and sort of the word has gotten out and Accreditation Canada actually recognizes CMBS effort and the fact that you know our review is a lot more in depth and it's very experienced people that are coming in and doing that assessment. And so I know that uh, they uh, they look at that as part of when they come to do their accreditation. And again, it's a lot of weight knowing that, oh, this facility or this um, you know region has had a peer review amongst um, the, the CMBS community. So which goes a long ways to saying, you know, how much uh, the program has had impacts uh, to our industry across the country. Uh, peer reviews require the clinical engineering programs to complete a pre-survey questionnaire. And to provide that provides information about the program. It includes policies, procedures. Uh, the documentation would include uh, sort of the organizational structure and explanation of the processes as well as the demographics. And that's to help the surveyors to understand the, 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 the program. And it will be an integral part as the part of the, the peer review. And it'll be that part that's sort of validated um, as the peer review moves forward. Uh, this would get submitted um, as part of the uh, requirements before it's even considered. So, Bill? So yeah, the um, the pre-survey questionnaire, which we'll call from now on, we'll just say PSQ. It's based on the current edition of the Clinical Engineering Standards of Practice for Canada, which is a CMBES publication. 
Again, this is a membership benefit. The uh, standards of practice is available free of charge for CMBES members at so this website. So if we go to the CMBES website, at the top of the menu, there are some options to move to different parts of the website. Clinical, and, clinical biomedical engineering is the sub page and then under that peer review and under that clinical engineering standards of practice. Um, if you're not a member of CMBES, it's going to cost you $200. So join CMBES. <laughs> Over to you, Kelly. Yeah, that uh, $200 will pay for the membership easily. So uh, in addition, uh, there is some additional uh, documentation that uh, is, you know, required as, as part of the, uh, the package, which um, includes that PSQ. And it's sort of more of a summary of sort of what what is the services positions on certain things? Like, for example, um, what's what's the services position on professional certification? Um, maybe they don't have a position on it, but just trying to flush that out. Um, you know, what's the services perspective on inventory tracking uh, the database as well as its accuracy of the database? sort of kind of summarizing sort of what the the, the service has uh, in place and, and how they prioritize um, some of the services that they do provide. Um, for example, what about PM process? So how are PMs scheduled? And is the service ensuring that the PMs are performed on time? Um, you know, some of this is kind of fleshed out as part of the, the pre-survey questions. But at the same time, it's an opportunity to give a little bit more details as part of that and in the submission of uh, peer review. The services, the other item that I wanted to mention, too, is the services involvement in the capital equipment planning. You know, um, it, it, going back many, many years, maybe clinical or biomedical engineering wasn't heavily involved. And we're seeing that it's more involved um, as, as, you know, the sort of what clinical engineering can bring to the table. And so we want to know sort of what's the services um, stance on being involved in the capital equipment planning process. Bill? Okay, so additional documentation required. Um, we want, this is before the survey, we want you to submit an addition to the PSQ, um, what do you, what's your involvement in equipment purchase specifications? Um, do you have an example of a, a spec that you've worked on uh, as part of the procurement process? Um, what's your involvement in the hazard alert process? Um, do you use the ECRI alert system? Um, how are they distributed? How do you follow up on alerts? Um, how do you make sure that action is taken on all the alerts that are um, relevant to the organization. And thirdly, we want to look at your quality improvement philosophy and processes. Uh, do you have um, a document that outlines um, quality improvement initiatives, um, procedures? Do you do staff surveys? Do you uh, interview your customers? How do you um, figure out how to make improvements to your service. And moving quite along, Kelly. Yeah, and then to, in addition to all of that, um, the, sur uh, the survey committee would like the service to provide, ideally, a soft copy. Um, we're just in that technology age nowadays, but um, copies of the policy and procedures manual. Uh, if you do have a quality assurance manual, um, provide a soft copy of that. Um, provide some statistical reports that you generate. Um, you know, the ones that you provide on a regular basis, what do they look like? Sort of just, it's just a snapshot of what you guys, what, what the service um, will generate. So obviously a common one out there is PM completion reports. Um, so just a snapshot of what that looks like. Um, and again, this is just to give the surveyors a sense of 
what's in play. And then of course, once the site visit comes, they'll uh, follow up further on that. But uh, this again, is just a snapshot, just to have the surveyor group review that before the survey. And then of course, what other documentation that might be critical? Um, you know, uh, your department might have some, you know, other applicable documentation that uh, might be beneficial for the surveyor team to review before uh, the actual peer review, Bill. Yeah, just just one other comment on the um, the quality assurance activities. So we want to know, um, and this is similar to what um, accreditation looks at. What are you? Do you have and what are the key performance indicators? So what what things are you measuring to tell you whether or not you're actually doing a good job at providing the service? And that's where this two-way learning comes in because we discover other people have key performance indicators that we've never thought of before as surveyors. So um, it's a great um, mutual exchange of ideas when we talk about uh, some of these indicators. Um, okay, next slide. So I'm going to talk just a bit about how long do you need to prepare for a peer review survey? Well, it depends on the size of the service, obviously, and how complex it is. Have you got multiple sites and how big is your staff? But at least six months, you should think of this in terms of a six-month project or more um, to prepare your answers to the PSQ before the surveyors arrive, assemble the documentation, that uh, we've asked for. Um, so submit your requests at least six months before you wish the surveyors to arrive on site. And so you're probably gonna have to do some thinking before you submit that request about, gee, do we have, and you can download a copy of the uh, pre-survey questionnaire from CMBES website, but you take a look at that and think, oh my, we should get some of these processes a little more formalized so that we can give better answers to the questionnaire. So you, you may want to, to work on some of your processes for a few months before that six month window starts. Um, also the peer review committee is going to need time to put together a team of surveyors. Like if, and it, it depends on the, the service that is requesting the survey. If you're, for example, a, a, a children's hospital we will want to put someone who's worked in a children's hospital on the survey team so they can um, ask informed questions about um, your activities. Kelly. Yeah, and maybe Bill, just to add to that too, is it's it's not imperative that you have all your ducks lined up either, right? Um, it, you know, it's if, if there's, you know, I wouldn't necessarily de delay a peer review because you want to have, uh, sort of everything uh, in order um, by all means uh, you know it's this this isn't a um, you know a process to to figure out oh geez you know you're, you're not meeting the requirements it's more of a well maybe this is where you need to to concentrate on or maybe this is where maybe you might want the peer review to come in so that when you go to to maybe try to improve some of those processes um you're hearing from your peers across the country on maybe the best way to approach that so yeah yeah and just to amplify that the the, the greatest benefit you'll get from a peer review is if you've not quite got everything in place um because it'll help you um prioritize um what things you should be working on next to get to the next level uh whereas if you can pass every question on the survey as substantially complete, well, there's not much to talk about then. Um, there's more to talk about if you're just kind of struggling to um, improve your service and having some challenges that um, we can help you overcome. So just, uh, I guess the, the perspective we'd like to convey is that the surveyors are not there to, with a critical eye to give you a pass-fail. It's not a pass-fail process. It's a quality improvement process. So uh, we're there working on your side. We're not on opposite sides. We're on the same side. We're trying to help you um, improve your service and bring it up to the next level. 
move on to the next slide. So talking about final preparations, um, this is in the month before the surveyors arrive. You should be thinking about a list of the key stakeholders. So you think the surveyors should meet. Um, you should put together a list of at least six to eight stakeholders, depending on the size of the organization. Could be more than that. But must include the administrator that clinical engineering reports to. We want to talk to your boss. Um, you should get them to clear a block of at least a half an hour on their calendars during the time the surveyors are on site. And it's that interview with uh, the person you report to that perhaps has the most value in this survey process because when we sit down with them for a half hour and ask them to think about the strengths and weaknesses of the clinical engineering service and ask them a bunch of questions it's probably the most time, the biggest block of time they've ever spent thinking about your service. And so there's a great deal of learning takes place on the part of the administrator when we're quizzing them about your service. So that's just uh, to emphasize one of the major benefits of um, getting a peer review done. Next slide, Kelly. And as we've already touched on here, the PSQ, so here's just a snapshot, but uh, again, it, it, it correlates um, specifically with the, the standards of practice document. And um, basically you're, you're doing a, a scoring of, of where you feel your service is at. And so there's this, the, the scoring codes here that uh, are you compliant, minimal, like it's not a, we're, we're, we're 80% there. It's more, is it minimal, is it partially or fully um, compliant? And so the I know there's another slide coming up too, but it, it really does um, sort of hone in on um, what your self-assessment is like. And then the surveyors come in and then they do the exact same sort of review. Bill? Um, yeah, so... Um... The next few slides just kind of are highlighting some of the changes in the new edition of the standards of practice. There's a lot more emphasis on um, connected systems. And so in this particular one, we're talking about um, accept acceptance testing of integrated networked equipment that sends data between equipment and clinical applications. And the next slide uh, expands on that a bit. Um, where we talk about developing policies and procedures in cybersecurity and protection of medical devices and systems. Um, and uh, Kelly, give you the next one. Yeah, and then this one here, of course, is talking about, um, you know, that collection of information for all connected medical equipment to ensure proper security measures are in place. This is obviously one that the committee that... Uh, um, updated and reviewed the, the standards of practice, felt that, you know, we wanted to make sure that this was now in the standards of practice document. And here it is now also being um, part of the sort of assessment, if you will, with the, uh, the peer review. So here's an example of a PSQ document, just one page that was filled out by um, um, Niagara Regional Health or I'm not giving away any confidential information, I don't think, but this was back in 2018, so it's been updated since then. But um, we use the codes uh, shown at the top, as you've seen before. And then the comments section provides um, opportunity for you as a site to provide detail about um, backing up your score. So, uh, and... Um, encourage you not to sort of embellish and say you're substantially compliant in everything because then it's a much less interesting process. But if there's some uh, honest assessment that maybe you're only partially compliant on some things, minimal, minimally compliant on others, we can get into a conversation about, uh, we understand you need to work on that one, but maybe this other standard is more important for you to put some energy into. Um, 
So this one talked about devices in inventory, the CMMS. So you have a documented policy for identifying those devices appropriate to the inventory. So that just says that um, we don't just want to see your inventory. We want to see how you decide what you should put in the inventory and what you can leave out. Any other thoughts on that, Kelly? No. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Talking about the site builder. Over you, Kelly. There's Kelly in the picture. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously the team of Surveyor uses that exact PSQ and uh, they now put their own rating in there. And as Bill really just alluded to is, is that it's that difference so those are the ones that we're going to hone in on, right? So if we agree, then um, that's great. But where the opportunities are for discussion, of course, is, you know, why does the surveyor team maybe feel that you're not quite where you think you might be? And that's why, again, some backup information and, and part of the site review is even just to validate um, what was supplied in that PSQ um, is actually happening and being able to validate what that might look like. And I know there's a few more slides to help kind of explain that a bit more, Bill. Okay, so the physical on-site visit usually lasts several days, depending on the size of the organization. And so um, that includes um, an audit of your equipment inventory, an audit of your work orders. We interviewed the staff in the clinical engineering service, as well as the clients and senior management. We take a tour of the facility and um, as shown here, Mario is um, reviewing department records. Uh, so we, we ask you know, to sit down with one of your staff who's uh, comfortable walking us through your database to show us the different um, records that you've got stored there and the completeness. So uh, we'll do an audit of your inventory and there's you know a number of things that we want to see in the um, inventory. Um, maybe I'll move on to the next one. Kelly can talk about that. Yeah, Bill, and maybe just to add to that, um, you know, by obviously again, it really is dependent on the size of your organization, what you're all wanting to be included as part of the peer review. Um, you know, the one that I participated in in Niagara Health, uh, I think it was a, it's a team of five, um, to help speed things up, um, each of the surveyors will uh, sit down with some assigned staff to be able to do their own audit. And that way, you know, we don't have five surveyors all looking over the shoulder of this one individual and uh, only doing one audit. Um, we'll break it out so that we can get a better sample and uh, the team will, you know, come back together after and review that information. But as this slide indicates here, it's that random audit. And so quite often what'll happen is, is as part of the tour of the facility, uh, like Accreditation Canada, um, you know, we'll look around and uh, maybe we'll find some assets and we'll just note down their, their asset tag number. And then uh, later on, uh, after the tour, we'll head back to the biomedical or clinical engineering shops and we'll take that and we'll go in and we'll look and see what's in the database. Uh, we'll make sure that, you know, it's, it's got some full descriptions, meaning uh, the serial numbers are in there. Description of the equipment kind of lines up with what we saw as part of the tour, um, ensuring that uh, it's showing what the next PM due date might be. Uh, some of the information might be like purchase dates and PO numbers. Now, I, I, I do know that obviously, um, you know, many years ago, uh, our departments, clinical engineering departments, were not necessarily gathering that information, but that information is a lot more readily available now. And so even though we might pick an old asset, it might not have it um, as we do an audit, you know, it'll help us maybe see that, uh, yeah, there's a few that might be missing some of the purchase dates or the PO numbers, but overall the the number and we'll tally that up is to sort of this is the number of assets that we did an audit on and this is the percentage of 
information that was maybe missed or whatever, right? So, but there's an opportunity to explain, you know, oh, well, we switched over uh, systems and therefore this information wasn't in our previous one. Bill? Okay, yeah, just following up on that. Um, as well as looking at your asset information, we wanna look at the work order information. How complete are the work orders? Um, do you include details like what, what was the type of work? Do you use failure codes to describe what was wrong? If you use failure codes, then it allows you to search for the frequency of a certain type of occurrence, like uh, user error, for example, or use error, as we like to call it. Um, do you document who it was that completed the work? Is the status of the equipment um, documented? Is it out of service? How many items are out of service? versus uh, when the work order is closed, does the status change to back in service? Mm -hmm. um, do you keep track of replacement parts? Uh, what's, your, what's your approach to um, tracking parts replacement? Uh, that's always a challenge because uh, some people advocate, you know, having in their CMMS an, an inventory of replacement parts, but that's a huge work requirement to do that. So, just how successful are you at uh, keeping track of, of replacement parts? And and of course, obviously, how much, um, to what extent do you keep track of time taken to complete a work order? Um, any other thoughts on that, Kelly? Yeah, Bill, and maybe just to add, like, um, I, I know that, you know, that is a challenge, uh, you know, a part replacement inventory, but, you know, is the service at least keeping track of what part pricing is and so that it helps with the overall cost of ownership for that piece of equipment. So at the end of the day, you know, you're able to at least say, well, yeah, we don't have a parts inventory program, but we were able to um, sort of uh, um, look at how much maybe uh, has been invested in this piece of equipment because we do keep track of replacement part pricing in our work orders. Right, and just to emphasize that a bit more, if you're one of the metrics you could track if you had um, adequate information in all your work orders is total cost of ownership of a device or and the cost to service ratio of the department. Um, so there are some metrics that um, are available to you once you start tracking a more complete um, information on the work orders. Um, Next one, over to you, Kim. Yeah, and so this is, these are just some of the examples, but you know, we kind of articulated earlier in the in, in the session about um, the the importance of the interviews, and and again, it's it, this is actually the service that will set up these because um, obviously the surveyors don't know, you know, the people that are within your organization that's best to 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 to, to interview, but as a service. You know, who do you want the surveyors to sort of have a voice to within the within the, the group? And, you know, uh, obviously, again, um, as Bill had mentioned on one of the slides before, is, you know, a minimum of eight, six to eight stakeholders. But again, uh, you know, the more you have, um, the more um, we can drill down. So, uh, well, you know, when we go into these interviews, we'll we'll ask, you know, um, to find out, you know, how much do you know about your clinical engineering department? Like, who's your your key contact? Um, how do you obtain the service? Um, are they responsive? Are they doing regular um, walkthroughs of the department? Or do you see them on a regular basis? What's the after hour support look like? Are you know? Do you include your 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 team in equipment replacement? Do you have any concerns that? Um, you want to bring forward um, that we can help maybe improve on, you know, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? If they have any, um, any additional services, again, we kind of articulated this before, but the other part in this is that who we're interviewing. So I know that um, in the uh, peer review that, that I participated in um, our very first interview was a half an hour with the president of the organization. So again, um, just that visibility, um, 
you know, you, multiple different levels. You can do, uh, we, we've interviewed um, vice presidents down to executive directors, to directors, managers of the clinical departments, and also managers and directors of maybe support departments like your IT department and or uh, your maintenance department. Bill, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Um, just, just to emphasize that all of those interviews um, force those people to think about your service in a way they may never have done before and kind of open their eyes to some possibilities that they hadn't thought of before. Up to the next slide. So getting close to the end here, we um, on the last day of the surveyor's visit, we will wrap up with a meeting with as many members of your clinical engineering service as can be pulled into a meeting. Um, and we usually spend up to an hour just commenting on our findings and our thoughts and give a very brief summary of what we think um, your priorities should be moving forward. Um, but then um, and, and there's time for some dialogue between us and the staff members, so get some feedback from them as to how they thought the process went. But then after we leave the organization, there's still more work to be done. And the next slide, uh, over to you, Kiel. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, you have a survey team come in, your peers come in, and they do all of this, and then um, the reason that we kind of meet with everybody at the end is like a synopsis of how everything went, maybe just some of the comments, share some of the comments with the teams. Um, because what happens after that is the, the, the committee will now go away and it could be quite a few months after pulling all this information together and coming up with the final report. And, uh, you know, obviously, it, it, you know, there, there's a, this final report, and as it, as the slide indicates, that it's a summary report. And I just want to emphasize that there is a lot of time and effort spent in this final report. I know that in our last peer review, um, that report was actually 114 pages long, uh, very detailed. Uh, it goes into, um, you know, obviously the um, sort of the the the, the what the peer review gave as a as a, a rating on your pre-survey questions and where we felt you were at. Um, but it also includes that final report will include some high level comments that we that we receive from um, your your clients or your departments or your even your leadership. Uh, it also includes um, detailed summary of the audit. So you get to see what we found uh, with respects to that random audits and sort of, you know, what did the, the, the sort of the sample, uh, what did it look like? And we provide that in that uh, final report as well. Uh, Bill? Yeah, just to comment on the right-hand side of this slide. So you also get a certificate, but just want to point out that the certificate does not say, you know, pass or fail. It says you've completed the peer review process. Um, so we we always want to emphasize this is a quality improvement process. It's not a product, it's a process. And so the outcome isn't a pass or fail. Um, the outcome is the final report, really, a, a set of recommendations. The certificate just, it gives you something to put on the wall, um, point to a credit point to to the accreditation surveyors, but um, the real, uh, the most important outcome is that final report. Next. And Bill, maybe, maybe just to add too, is that um, that report emphasizes the strengths as well. And those, you know, if that report is shared with your executives, they see what your peers across the country feel that the program has that they're doing very well. And it really articulates that uh, at that their level as well. Okay. Um, just to answer some questions that may be in people's minds, what does it cost? Who pays? So um, 
This is a voluntary process. The surveyors are volunteers. They're not charging for their time. Um, but there are expenses involved. So there's travel expenses to get to the site, accommodation expenses, meals. So um, those will be charged to the organization that is being surveyed. Um, in addition, there are kind of hidden costs like meeting rooms and lunches that you could provide for the surveyors. You know, we expect hot meals and uh, champagne with, uh, anyway, kidding. But again, emphasizing it's, it's just um, expenses that we need to be recovered from you as an organization being surveyed. And it's going to be of the order of magnitude of maybe between five and ten thousand dollars. So you need to be able to uh, have a budget allocation for that before you start this process or get approval for that level of expenditure. Uh, Kelly, any thoughts? Yeah, no, the other thing, I, obviously, we, we want to save um, costs where possible. So as an example, I know it, it's it's in here. One of the uh, one of the bullets here talks about transportation. So our last review, actually, we visited, I think it was five or six sites. And so uh, we rented a van and the and the committee uh, then toured around to all of these other sites. So, again, we were, you know, obviously we want to try to, to save as much money or, or the, the expense to the organization or to, to sorry, to the uh, committee, um, but also to the organization. Right. Because uh, they're the ones that need to free up some meeting rooms and, and, and potentially cover some lunches and stuff. Bill. So, yeah, just um, summarize what we would cover in the final report. Um, actually, this is your slide, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, so as our, it was already commented on, but of course, it's the strengths of the service, opportunities for improvement, where we feel that maybe the um, from this report, what they should be um, working on next, conclusions and recommendations. Um, and yeah, just bringing it all together in that final report. Okay, we're just about at the end and we'll open it for questions. These were just some of our past reviews. We haven't had one actually since 2018. Um, and uh, COVID got in the way of this, but we're trying to get the service back, get the peer review service back on the rails. Um, and uh, Kelly, talk about this slide. Yeah, and so just real summary, because I want to make sure we've got some time for some comments. But one of the thing that, um, you know, as you probably noted in that previous slide, is is that uh, sick kids as well as Niagara Health, they actually had two, and so it's it's that first one is the foundation, and so with Niagara, they wanted to see you know where they are compared to their first one, and so from that very first one, there were recommendations made, and this here is just commenting on the fact that. You know, and they supplied this as part of the second review is, is that th these were the recommendations that were put forth by the peer committee. And here's where we're at today. And as Bill kind of alluded at the beginning of the of the um, webinar is that, um, you know, they weren't providing service to X-ray. And that was one of the recommendations. And based on um, their feedback, they were able to expand the scope. Um, obviously, uh, don't know the details of how much of it was expanded, but it was something that was recommended and they took action on it. Bill? Yeah, well, okay. We'll um, just, that's just to show that um, it's not a one-off process. It's it's sort of, you need to do it every few years to uh, keep moving on your quality improvement journey. Um, peer review committee is all of these people. Um, but let's get to the uh, open the floor for questions from our audience. Back to Michael. Great. Thanks, Kelly and Bill. That was uh, really, really, really interesting. Um, it, we, we have a, a bunch of questions in, in the Q&A um, uh, box. Thank you for using the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, something that I, I found quite interesting, and it ties in the, the follow-up survey for Niagara and also the certificate for sick kids that you showed, because I noticed the effective four, and it was like a four-year period. Um, I know it's not a pass-fail, but do you, similar to Accreditation Canada, give a 
one to five years kind of effectiveness, depending on did you have mostly S's as in substantial satisf satisfactory, or if you have a whole bunch of, mm, got to work on that, maybe you'd only give them a one year effectiveness? Uh, no, <laughs> short answer. Um, it's, um, it's really just offered as a tool for quality improvement. Okay. Um, so we're not we're not saying, oh, you got to pull up your socks, guys. We want to come back in a year and see that you've actually done these following things. No, um, it's here. Here's our recommendations. Take them and run with them. That's so it's it's quite a bit more hands off than the accreditation. Kelly? And that's what I thought you were you were going to say. I, I wanted to feed you because I, I wanted to really reinforce the don't be scared of this. This is a good thing. You want to bring them in get them to review, get someone else to say, hey, these folks are doing a good job. Um, here's a question from Anthony. Uh, from the surveys conducted so far, can you give a few examples of some common deficiencies of uh, or areas that, uh, that need improvement? Hmm. Um, well, as, as Kelly mentioned on that Niagara Health follow-up, we found they had they had um, acted on things like we had suggested they get more involved in imaging. Um, we may we often find big gaps in their asset inventory, like they've maybe they've got make, model, and serial number, but the location's unclear, or there's you know so an audit of the inventory often finds huge gaps, uh, indicative that. An inventory isn't a static document that um, things are moving around and you should be doing, ideally, you should audit your inventory once a year to do a sample of your inventory and see if you've actually got good information there. Uh, so that's another one that commonly uh, we find uh, some deficiencies in. Uh, yeah, maybe just one other one that comes to my mind, uh, I'll just add to you is, is that, you know, obviously the day to day stuff, um, maybe not so much so, but I know that recalls, how do, how do departments handle recalls? And there's a lot of variability across the country, I think, when it comes to that. So that's just one of the areas where there might be some room for improvement. So a common one that we might see. Yeah, I imagine the next uh, the next peer review you do because of the now we have Vanessa's law, it'll be uh, have a very different flavor as well. Um, kind of along those lines, because we we really reinforced the um, the Vanessa's law um, updated language in the CSOP, and also as you mentioned, uh, we really worked on um, improving cybersecurity and those aspects in the in the CSOP. Um, million years ago, 2007, I was at Amy and they had a whole stream on the 80,000 series ISO. So IT um, change management kind of stuff. So cybersecurity for them, of course, is old hat. And although we've been doing some flavors of it because of networking devices that are really, we're not, we're a little new to the game on cybersecurity. So can you comment, for instance, if when someone comes in, they might really want to reinforce the inner um, one or two of their suggested interviewers to be from the IT networking side, um, as also maybe you each have a parent senior exec um, and interview them to see the desired synergies um, and where things could be improved, et cetera. I know I'm leading you. Um, but I think we live this. I think we all live this right across the country. We live with IT. Um, can you comment on how this peer review process can help folks get better traction on working with IT and each of you together and singly get better support on working together is really what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, yeah, that's... Again, with the interviews, um, we want to go and talk to a senior person in IT, which will raise their consciousness. I mean, I, IT kind of lives in their own little silo uh, many times. And, and this is an opportunity to kind of break down the walls a bit and um, um, 
open their eyes to uh, different ways of looking at at the organization and its equipment. Uh, Kelly. Yeah, and I know that just from the one in Niagara, for example, we did sit down with the top person from from IT, and it was it was really good. I mean, there was dialogue, there was interviews, and it again heightened um, the, the 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 service to IT and. To be fair, IT recognized that in that particular example. So again, you know, it's really important for the service who wants the peer review to make sure that we're meeting with the key people, especially if even the department itself realizes we need some help here. So um, you know, let's let's arrange that interview and make sure that uh, our, the voice can be heard at that level. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, question from Parisa. Um, great information. Thank you. What has been the experience of those who have done this as in peer review in the past? Did it actually help the department to gain traction on its needs? I'm wondering if she's meaning, did they get more budget to tackle their challenges? That That's my assertion. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, um, I see Mario is in the audience and Mario has had as head of sick kids had two surveys. Uh, I'm wondering if can we turn on Mario's mic? Are you there, Mario? Could you talk about that as a recipient of peer reviews as opposed to us? Or promoting? Oh, actually, he just wrote back. Okay. I'm not sure if he can turn his mic on if we have that facility, but I can read out his response. Hi, Parisa. Yes, we use them to improve the service. We use the recommendations and the department, the departmental QM committee followed up each month. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, that brings us to 158. And we actually have, I think, 10 other questions, which, which is fantastic. Uh, as is normal, Kelly and Bill, do you mind if we send a copy of these questions to you with those who asked? Usually what we'll do is... Um, We'll try and do a blast out to everyone who attended for for the answers, because uh, I think many people, not just the person who asked the question, would be interested in the answer. Um, so if you're OK with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course. OK, yeah. uh, with that, it is 158 um, and we are all probably on a lunch break. Uh, so I want to be very respectful of people's time. Um, thank you very much, for instance for your time presenting today. Really, really interesting. I think it really enforces that this is not something to be scared of. They're not coming in. They're they're not going to hit you over the head with a velvet two by four. This is actually a good thing that will help you maybe get some extra recognition, extra maybe some resources, or just get your uh, exec to think a little bit different way to help you do what you do. Um, so for that, thank you very much, Ellie and Bill. Um, our next, uh, I believe we, after this, our webinars are into our uh, Celebrating Women in Engineering series in March. Really looking forward to that. So check out the, uh, I believe that's in the latest bulletin. And there's some details on there as well. I'll give a shout out and a plug. I actually have to do my own registration and book my hotel for the uh, conference in Toronto this year, which is in May. Um, and as always, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, this, of course, gets recorded, puts on our YouTube channel. Lots of great content there historically, if you want to go check it out. And uh, really looking forward to seeing everyone on the next webinar. Bye. Happy Thursday, everyone.